So, um, all right, we're just gonna do, we're gonna take some time here, we're gonna do some Q&A. Uh, just so you guys know, before we uh, do the q and I just wanna give you a couple things really quick. Um, after this, right, we go to lunch. It's right out here, they're already setting it up for us, it looks amazing. Uh, and then you basically got, I think it's two and a half hours, so we need to be back in the room, the main room, ready to start at four o'clock. What time do we need to be back by? Four. So be in the room probably five or ten minutes early or be ready to be in the room five or ten minutes early so we can start on time. Tonight's session is going to be powerhouse session and I'm super excited about our MCs for that, se for that session because uh, they've been preparing really well to make it entertaining and fun for you guys. Um, and our speakers are top notch. So um, I believe that tonight is going to be the best part of the event, not to discredit tomorrow. Tomorrow's gonna be amazing too, but tonight is really something that we've designed for you guys based on your feedback. So make sure you're in the room, make sure you're ready to rock and roll, make sure you bring your energy, make sure you connect with the vendors. Um, I know you've heard it a few times, but they've all spent a lot of money to be here and a lot of their time to be here. Um, and so, you know, just take some time to go connect with people, whoever it is, whatever you wanna talk about, go connect with them, even if it's just learning what they do, um, whatever. So, um, and have fun. Uh, and then of course tonight be responsible because we break at eight, right? And uh, so we break at 8 o'clock, and it's just free time. But remember, too, we have a whole meeting planned for tomorrow. We've got speakers that have worked really, really hard on their messages for tomorrow morning. Why am I telling you this now? Because y'all are coordinators. You're the people that everyone else is looking up to. You're the role models. You're the examples. So go have fun tonight. I'm going to have fun tonight. But also be responsible and make sure that you and your teams are prepared to be back tomorrow morning to be part of the messages, right? Because we want to give the speakers tomorrow the same level of attention and energy and excitement uh, and presence that we've given everyone up to this point so far. So that said, let's do some q and I'm curious, does anybody have any questions for these guys? Awesome, so I'm gonna run the mic. You guys have a mic? Uh, tell okay. me who to go to. Dante answers all the questions. Okay, Brian. awesome, Carlton has hand up first, so Carlton. My question is for Dante. Oh, cool, um, there's one, <laughs> right out the gate. And, uh, it's concerning whenever you're talking about the, uh, when you recruit and um, retain the new team members, you, meant you had a part where you kept mentioning uh, you have to manage their emotions whenever yeah. they get through like that September. And I've talked to multiple CSPs about this, mm -hmm. um, this, this thing with the September. And I don't, I don't think it's an anomaly that September is, a, is a, like a really difficult time for the kids. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wanted to see what, what you're doing to communicate to your leaders on the team to like actually articulate that to where it's not just you as the bottleneck to have this be a conversation that happens with these people that are being retained, especially at that type of volume. Because I can only imagine having to manage 20 human beings. Um, it can't just be your job sure. at some level. So what are you doing yeah. to make sure that that's done? Sure. So ask him basically like, how do I get the leaders on board with saying the right things? So in their first 30 days, like, they don't botch it, basically. So the, um, and, and by, by the way, this, this takes, uh, and, and he knows this too, man, he's just managed a long time. You have to coach CSPs how to talk to reps at this level sometimes, right? So like, as you know, we got a lot of very talented people on our team, and I'm very fortunate enough that they buy into me very heavily, so they'll do exactly what I ask them, like, whatever I ask them to say, especially in their first campaign, they just repeat it verbatim. Even if they don't necessarily agree with all the points that I try to make with them. Um, great example is, um, uh, you guys all know Sean, right? Like, Sean is a very talented, like, hardcore, like, very good salesperson, right? And we're all really good friends with him and everything. And um, I, it took me a while to, to get him on board with understanding with, like, with brand new reps, like with us. The way we learn is a lot different than a new rep. So I had to sit down with Sean when I became coordinator very soon or very, um, not that long ago, and I had to have a conversation with them, and we were like playing Madden while we were having this conversation, and like, I told him, I was like, hey man, just for real, like, during this month, there's probably gonna be some struggling reps, like August, September, October, like, there's gonna be reps that are not going to sell a lot, and they're gonna come to you because they look up to you, right? Because you sell more than pretty much everyone on our team, consistently. I need you to make sure that when these conversations come up to you, um, I would just ask that you tell them what they need to hear right now, because his natural response to that was like, well, what do they need to hear? I'm like, when they ask you, like, tell you they're struggling, what do I need to do to do better, and so on and so forth? Like, what do you do? How do you sell so much? Like, that classic question. And it's like, um, his response is like, hey, honest with you, man, like, I have a, I've been around a long time, I have a big schedule, I've sold a lot of knives and everything, and it's great, 
but if there's any piece of advice that I could give you at this point right now, before you become me, I need you to develop yourself. And the way you develop yourself is like, you need to know your stuff. Meaning that, dude, if I quizzed you right, and I, I literally watched him do this at Year in Banquet with one of our new guys too, right? He's kind of like roller coaster month to month, right? And he asked him at Year in Banquet, like, what do I do? And he's just like, bro, like, if you do your new customer script right now, do you got it down? Like, would I feel like you're actually pretty good at selling sets? Dude, could you sell me an ultimate upgrade right now, like at the booth? Bro, could you do, could you do a pro, like a quality upsell, right, from a five piece to a set, so on and so forth. And I just watched Sean nail it. But because he has that high level sales influence, what come, I can say the same thing to him all day, right? But because it's coming from Sean, a different perspective, it means more to that rep particularly. So. I'm basically speaking through Sean to that rep, but because it's coming from Sean, it has more of an impact. And I do it the same way with all of our leaders. I do it with Joseph, I do it with Sean. Josh is already really good at it. And then we have like all these other people that they, they don't understand how to talk to these reps. So I coach them and I teach them. And again, they buy into me as coordinator, so they, they do what I ask them to do because they know that this is really important. It doesn't affect their business at all, but they, deep down, they really want to help and develop some new kids, they like that, right? and I just teach them how to do that, and they, I speak through them. Can we give Dante one clap on three? One, two, three. Nice. Okay, I Am I supposed have, to call people or you? I have two questions for Dante. Um, they're quick Where? questions. So the first one, um, how long are oh. your meetings typically? Like our, like our monthly team meetings? Uh, they're five to nine, four hours. They actually used to be shorter. They used to be three. But being on the team long enough, I was like, three's not long enough. I get one crack at them per month. This is the only four hours I get with them outside of like a weekly workshop or something like that, right? I assume that this is the only four hours I get. So I'm gonna make sure they book a lot of appointments and get a lot of shows and they get drill for skill in. That's a lot of things to cram into four hours when you actually put it all on paper. Definitely. Um, and then follow up to that, are these meetings just specifically for the new reps on the team? 100%, does... varsity and down. Okay. So anyone that's not a key events member like a CSP, our CSPs are our leaders. The varsity are the up and coming people, like the people that are under 150, right? And then the JV group are all the onboarding members. Okay. And then the people that have bonused out that need to work their way back on. All of that goes there. Do you have specific meetings for your leaders separately then? Mm -hmm. Once a campaign, totally different topics, totally different information. We used to have it combined. We don't do that anymore because as the, this is something that I had to learn before I was a coordinator, when I was Pato's assistant, right? This was a learning thing for me, is that, because I was a big belief, like, every month, meeting, every month, like, leaders, every, I've learned really quickly that, like, look, Sean's got a whole bunch of things going on. Joseph has a whole bunch of things going on. Pato's got a whole bunch of things. Josh has a whole bunch of things going on. And so the way we have it structured now is that they go, we have one key events meeting. It's all day. We do it once a campaign, pretty much all day. It's like six, seven, eight hours, something like that. And uh, we go through, we just hammer through a bunch of topics. Basically, if they're in that room, I need to make sure that anything that I need to handle and the conversations I need to have with those people in that four month span, I need to have that in that eight hours of having them all in the room at the same time. And they like it because they, they get it. They're like, hey, we can hash out all of our stuff in that one day for the whole campaign. And then at the same time, like, they get value because I have guest speakers, like we had Matt Graves talk at like our last key events meeting about package deals, right? And then um, I still have a target to get Brandon Brown to talk at our next one. So you're gonna get a phone call, just so you know. And uh, there's a lot of people here. Yeah, peer pressure, just letting you know. <laughs> but there's a lot of people in this room I have on a hit list. So that way my next, you know, six key events meetings, which is two years out, by the way, I have a hit list of quality, high level content that is important for these people. We don't role play the scripts at the key events meeting with like new customers, no. Like, but we get information that those particular people need and things that they asked for. And my job as coordinator is to go get those things and bring it to those people, because I only see them once every four months. Okay, and then one more follow up to that. Sorry, I'm hogging the mic. Um, <laughs> You're good. Are you doing those in the beginning of the campaign then? Like January, February, or middle, or? The way we have it structured, it's the month before the new campaign because we used to have them like the first week of the campaign, people are like, because we pick our shifts, you know, for the campaign, and it's like, we, it's hard, especially again with CSPs being everywhere, it's like we need more time to plan, so we need to do it a month beforehand, so we'll do it like the beginning of the month, and then four weeks later will be like the first shift of the campaign that they picked. 
Cool. And, uh, just to clarify, being a key events member on Dante's team, like we as key events members are also required to maintain one of one of the standards to maintain our position on the key events team is that we have to attend and teach at one yes. of our traditional events meetings at least once a campaign. So that way our entire leadership team or key events team is consistently, there's always somebody at a traditional events team meeting each month, um, but not all of us are required to be there at every meeting all the time. So mm -hmm. that way Dante's always got exposure and influence to and from the key events team staff. Face to names. They only see the names on the report. They don't ever get to meet the people. Oh, yeah. So, wow, I'm loud. God, I'm so loud, y'all. Why didn't anyone tell me? All right. Um, thank you, Rochelle. Just one, one quick thought. Um, I, I'm, I'm such a big believer with all these things that there's more than one right answer. And, and half the time, the important thing is the journey you go to to get to said answer. Like, that's what's more significant um, than, than where you're at. Uh, I, I will just say, just as, as a thought, like, for us, we do all our meetings jointly. Once a campaign, we do have a key events meeting. Um, that's for sure. But uh, we, do, uh, we do expect our leaders to be at, at our regular meetings, too. And don't get me wrong, it's, it's not always easy. Um, we, we expect our people to be at at least half of the meetings each campaign campaign, our leadership group. Um, we know that stuff happens, and it's never an issue. Uh, but, but the reality is our philosophy is that if, if, you know, once every eight weeks you can't, like, carve out some time in your schedule to spend two hours with the team, maybe this isn't enough of a significant channel in your business that, that it, it, it just has to be prioritized. I don't think that everyone needs to do that. But, but my point I wanted to make was this. Don't underestimate the fact that I personally believe the single biggest retention tool that we have for new reps is exposure to experienced reps. That's the only thought I have is just whatever that needs to look like, whether it's having key event people at your meeting or trying to get your whole team together like we can make an effort to do, the number one retention tool, it is, it is not opportunity, it's not money, it's, it's none of that. The thing that keeps them around is what they see with the experienced people. Um, it's social proof, it gives them confidence, it's, it's what they want. So just make sure you're finding a way to integrate that. That's true. Um, Is it on? I just wanted to thank, thank, say thank you to you three for coming. Um, I'm just going to be totally frank and real because that's what you like. Um, Rochelle and Brandon asked me to come to this. I wasn't going to be in here. I was going to be in there. And I'm really glad I came because it's in the years past, and this is something for probably Dave, but a lot of like you especially, in years past, there's been a lot of like the coordinate. I'm not a coordinator. So the coordinator breakout was very like admin heavy and like I would look at the agenda. I'm like, oh, I can't do that. I'm going to go in there. And this time, I wasn't sure, and you know, obviously with them asking, I said I'd come. To me, this is awesome, because as an FSM or a CSP, like we now understand a little bit more of our role. It's not like in the past, it's been more like a selfish thing, and now it's more a like giving thing, and it, this shows us how to give and like the way in which to do that. And I was quite frankly entertained by both of you the whole time, like talking about things, like very applicable information. So I'm a fan. Uh, thank you for that. And I just want to say thank you guys for driving us here too. I know some of my other team members are in the room too. So that just, to me, that's more valuable than in the past. So I just wanted to, moving forward, do more things like that. So that was my takeaway and I have two questions as well. Um, First, this is probably for Brian and Dave together. There was a slight mention of like a product pack for like Cutco donations. Like, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, uh, well that's, uh, so everybody that comes to the net gets a product compensation coupon. One of the options was a galley set. Brian was mentioning that he was going to use his for a donation. If I, if I have it correct, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is that like a flight compensation, co like yeah. a similar to that? It's, it's, that's exactly what it is. We just call it a product compensation coupon because. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. So have you awesome. have you checked in yet? I checked it, so that's checked probably why it. I don't that's exactly know what that is. It. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Delegation. Um, so okay, and then I guess a part B to that. I didn't think about this, but. I get asked about a few things a year, and I've just been to donate to like a Hanukkah boutique or a real estate thing or whatever. I've just been doing stuff at a third. Is there an option of getting more things like this for if it's strictly a donation? Yeah, that's. I know DBMs do that. 
that's at least my DVMs told me about that. Uh, what, what, what we've done is uh, part of the you know reason why we wanted to uh, honor Patton last night was uh, his work with the one third and, and making some of the changes and allowances to help expand that and make uh, you know more one third prevalent for just those purposes. We are not opposed to you know looking at that specifically for like event donations. I know that there are some people that use. Uh, Cutco to barter for the price down and, and you know we can help in those specific cases um, but if it's like a donation for entry into the event to be able to set up an exhibit absolutely on a case-by-case -case basis let us know and we'll see what we can do because there isn't like a, a document but there has been or a precedent that's been set but yeah. if we're able to do it we're more than happy to look at it but it just goes through a different form through the company that makes that final call not okay. us okay I can ask about that thank you and then, Dante, the last question is the three-page script you were talking about. How can we get that? Website. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I love it. Well done. Looks well like we're done. done. <laughs> okay. Nicole. Okay. So my question is about your assistance for Dante. Um, and then if I feel so special. you want to <laughs> chime in. Um, Compensation for assistance. Yep. So I know a lot of people do shift picking. Yep. We assign shifts. Mm -hmm. So rewarding people with a certain number of additional shifts mm -hmm. in my organization based on how it's structured doesn't really make sense. So I've been struggling to develop people into roles. It sounds like, first of all, just to clarify, those are people from your team. They're not outside mm -hmm. assistants. Yep, they're reps. Okay. And then, so I guess just quick question, how did you select those people? And then what is the compensation? Is it hourly? You said something about 250 per month. How exactly sure, does that sure, work? Sure, sure, um, sure. So a couple things. Um, so the first thing is, because I, again, I did this like first thing to do because I knew this was going to be a whole animal to have to, and I want to make sure I wasn't super or as overwhelmed as, you know, it could have been without them um, on the shift thing, because that was the thing that was being talked about because I know it's a very common practice, and this is again like Brian said, more than one right answer. This is the way I see it. Whenever we were doing the Lone Star like new coordinator thing, like everyone and their mom wanted to be the coordinator, right? And I was up against there was a lot of competition, a lot of high level competition and stuff. And um, so we actually made like it was it was like Josh and Stacy and Brian I think had input in as well. And they actually made like a like an actual job description packet of like this is everything from A to Z, from Z to A, back and forth of what a coordinator is responsible for whether you do them all yourself or you outsource it to someone else like an assistant, it's totally up to you. So whenever we talked about that with Stacy, we were thinking about doing the shift thing. I get some pushback from that obviously from our high level reps because they're like, assistant's gonna work San Antonio McGarden show, I sell a lot, that kind of sucks. So I took what they said, because I was gonna do the shift thing initially at first, but then when I got that perspective up front, I was like, took a step back and was like, let me think about it this way. This is my job. My role is to do all these things. I'm in charge of delegating certain things that I don't want to do, which are these things. So doesn't it make more sense if, since they're a duplicate of me, that I take a slice out of what I'm being compensated for versus taking away those high level shifts to our high level reps? Because it's not their job to get the stuff done. It's my job. So if I'm an outsource it to another person to take care of it, my job is to take a slice and pay them because they're an extension of me. Just like how we pay an assistant to Rolo, pay an assistant to do emails. That's my perspective of it, so that's why I do it that way. And by the way, the unexpected positive thing I got from that afterwards is that I immediately, anyone that was semi-skeptical of like the new change of the new coordinator and all that stuff, um, immediately washed away, and I have full buy-in now. So that question from earlier about like how do we have conversations, it affects stuff like that later because I realized it was my job. I sliced to pay out. I have full buy-in from all of our high-level CSPs now. And don't even question it. And you had another part of that too that I forgot. Was that all of it or was there another part to that? Oh, I'm sorry, sir. So recruited them really easily. We have a big team. I identified people I knew that would be rock stars at these roles. They're usually like the up-and-coming kind of people that want to help, right? But their schedule's not busy enough to where they like, don't have time to do this stuff. Um, I identified them, sat down with each of them during the summer before I took over the role officially, went exactly through what their job was, and then the compensation, um, I pay them $1,000 per campaign. So when I get paid, I just reroute 1000 bucks to their commission statement versus to me. So 
And uh, the booth manager one is like the least responsible one. Like it's very little duties, but something I don't want to deal with. So I, it's like 500 bucks a campaign, but she only has to do that like once or twice a campaign. But she takes care of all of it for me. I don't have to worry about the inventory for that and all that. And then for the stats and admin and the scheduling, they obviously have to do that every week and stay on top of it. Yeah, I'm more than glad to pay them each a thousand bucks so I don't have to deal with any of that stuff. Yeah. So again, more than one right answer. Um, just, I, and I say this just, just for perspective, because I feel like probably half the team, half this room is operating one way, half the room is operating the other. One is not superior to the other, for sure. But I will tell you, there is a point where as your team continues to grow and scale, there becomes so much tension at the top, it will, it will continue to pull you in so many ways. And I can tell you that one of the, maybe one of the most useful things I've done for our team is, is just my background as a manager is trying to identify bottlenecks. There's a lot of bottlenecks in the program, and, and what sucks is knowing that in 2015 and in 2017, I was the bottleneck. Like 100% as coordinator, I was the bottleneck. And it's, it sucks to realize that, but, but we got to a point where I had to say, okay, well, because I'm the bottleneck, that either means that I am not the right person for this task anymore, or no one is the right person for this task anymore because we're, we're not set up in a way that's scalable. So I can tell you, we, we do go with shifts and, and the money thing does come up every once in a while. It came up again here uh, right before our big um, strategic planning meeting in December. And don't get me wrong, I have no problem. I peeled out a thousand bucks just to help incentivize our rodeo this year because it's a really expensive show. No problem sharing the money. The money goes away really, really quickly. Really, really quickly. And I, I would just encourage the coordinators of the room, don't, don't sell yourself short. This is not a reflection of what Dante's doing. It's a strategic decision, and I respect it. Um, don't sell yourself short for the um, what is required of you and asked of you. I don't think necessarily carving away that is always the way to go. And honestly, I could tell Carlton, hey, I need a lot of time. I could tell Matt Foss, we need a lot of time from you guys, and I'm going to give you 500 bucks. But by giving them a quality event or two that they're going to sell 15 to 18 grand at, um, I mean, there's just there's there's nothing that competes with that. And, and so my, my, my thought, I would just say, is this. Just make sure whatever system you're doing, make sure you're applying some mental stress test to it. Okay, And like I said, it's, this is not a reflection on us versus any other way of doing it, but do consider the idea of scale because you will find that as you implement all these things you're learning at net, man, you do get to a point where like the coordinator does become the bottleneck. That's why we have two, um, and, uh, and that's why we have all our manager roles. So just make sure you're doing the discipline of figuring out how is this going to continue to scale as we continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And I will say that it does, they're right, it does create tough conversations because we have people like Chelsea who is a amazing, has the best averages on our team, and every campaign I have to go to her and say, these six people are all going to get like two shows before you. And that's not an easy conversation, and to Chelsea's credit, she's a pro, she gets it, but, but that's tough. I don't like having to do that, but it's the only method we have found to properly compensate people for what we need from them, and Chelsea understands that she's not the right person to occupy those roles because she has so many other channels that she needs to honor with her time. So that just puts then the pressure on me is going, great, how do we get more good events? How do we elevate the caliber of events we have so even though these shows are gone, I can go to a John Israel, I can go to a Chelsea, I can go to people who are on our leadership group but not managers and say your opportunity is not limited because you have a different role on the team. Um, we've carved out this really powerful space for you. So my, my, the, the, again, just do the stress test. Make sure you, what you're doing is scalable and don't don't make decisions because it prevents you from having tough conversations. Again, that is not what they have done. But I just mean in general, we've hid from that sometimes in the past. You just got to face it head on. Great stuff. That'll be useless. Is this helpful for anybody? All right, cool. We got time for two more questions. I'm going to come here. And then I want to see, does anybody in the back have a question? Anybody? Raise your hand. No? Well, then we'll go up here. So we'll do you guys the last two, OK? All right. Thanks, guys. Um, quick question, both of you, I'd love to get your input. I also want to open it up to any other coordinators in the room, especially if you're on the program where people pick their shifts. Uh, just come up and talk to me at the break or whatever. Um, I'm really curious to know how you decide how many shifts and what order and how many at a time and things like that. Uh, what's the criteria like for people picking shifts as opposed to being assigned? Sure. I think ours are like 90% similar, might be like it's slim or different, but I'll have Sarah's piece after. The, the way we pick, it's been the same ever since I was on the team. Um, we have leadership group, meets once a campaign, right, month before, and uh, we have everything up there on the board. We have 10 CSPs on our team, right, and we, we pick a campaign at a time, right? So 
We have the spring campaign. We spring the whole spring. Done, 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 done. Everything's set, right? The cool thing is with our team, we have large volume. So there's still a crap load of shows left over. Um, when we have our monthly team meeting, that's when they pick their shifts for the next two months, right? And so the way we break it down, we have like the varsity group, and then we got like the newbie group. The way they get on varsity is they have to sell, uh, they can't miss bonus for an entire campaign as a new rep. So they do a four, 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 four all the way through, they're immediately bumped up to varsity. It used to be a time thing, like be on the team for a year, but you're not a leader yet, that whole thing. So now I've, I changed it recently to where it's like, you don't miss bonus for your whole campaign and you'll get bumped up to the varsity group. Benefit of being on the varsity group. Well, number one is they get back to the team more. They do a workshop once a week that is gonna be required of them to like help with the new people on the team, to help them grow. Um, but in order for pick and shifts though, they basically get, they get one full round before the rest of the team starts picking. Cause we just do it like, like a draft order, right? You got the top sell person, you know, the bottom sales person, right? And everyone in between that. So the three people at the varsity group, pick, pick, pick. Round two, pick, 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 pick. And just start top to bottom, top to bottom, top to bottom till everyone's done. That's it. Perfect. So for us, when it comes to shift selection, um, there's two types, there's, well, there's more than two, but there's two main types of shows in our program. Uh, key events, which for us, key events used to be just like state fairs, but now key events represents the top 20% of shows in our program. So as the program scaled, it was top 20, and then it became top 50, and it's whatever. Top, top 20%. Those are only eligible for a leadership group, period. New guys don't even touch them. And we tell them that in training. We're like, hey, there's a good chance several of y'all will never earn the right to ever work these shows. But if you stick around long enough, some of you will. The good news is you'll have access to the other 200 events that we do. And isn't that exciting? And they don't, honestly, they don't resent that. As long as they know from the very beginning, you know, hey, these people have earned the right. And I think that's the biggest thing. One of the most challenging things when you work with high-level people is creating systems and dialogues that, that always check entitlement. And you gotta do that at every single level. So our team knows that they have to do certain things to earn the right to be on that. And I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not hesitant to ask them to do that. So similar to them, once a campaign, we have our leadership group meetings where we pick all the shows for the next campaign as far as key events go, those top 20% of shows. So Sometimes we'll drift into a few other ones if someone's schedule just really works. If, you know, if, you know, Brett Lancaster is such a great rep and he's like, I want to work this piddly show because it works for me this weekend. I'm like, go, son, go. All right. So by and large, though, we pick for the whole campaign. Um, and, and that's just done in a rotation. We have a shift selection order. The managers go first. Beyond that, we, we tier it. It's based off overall sales, booth average, and contribution to the division. A contribution to the division is weird and fuzzy. And people are like, how do you measure that? And it's kind of that thing like you know it when it's there and you know it when it's not there. Um, that's for sure. And that's a way to acknowledge people who, you know, are really helping drive the program forward. So that's how we do the order. Uh, we simply go through it. We just do the rotation. Um, month in or month out, or time in and time out, it's kind of where we fill in all the other shows. We do it at meetings. We'll do it outside of meetings. And for that, it's pretty simple. We have a selection order. A leadership group is still eligible to work those. Although, honestly, we have so many, you know, quality events now. They're not really trying to get in a lot of those shows. They'll help us test them here and there. But by and large, their schedule's built around the bigger events. So that, that's usually more towards the new guys. Earned, cool. opportunities. Right. Earned opportunities. Earned uh, opportunities. Last question right here, and then we'll break, okay? Hi. Question for Dante. Um, <laughs> Called it. <laughs> loved your, your training format. I had a question on what your recruiting funnel looks like that led into it. I saw a lot of collaboration. I heard, like, in SC2 having initial training. I thought that was sure. awesome. Tell me about it. Sure. So, copy-pasted Pato. Been doing it the same way for years. Didn't change anything. The one tweak that we did made is that we planted the seeds sooner because officially coordinator starting in like August at training, but took it over for Pado in May um, through the summertime for like recruiting purposes. So on the DM conference calls every week, I mean, in the summertime they have that. So I'm on the DM conference calls every week in the morning. They usually do it like Friday morning or something like that. I'll hop on, give my little 15 minute spiel of like, hey guys, this is the first contact they're gonna have with the events team, which we have three summer meetings. We got like the division meeting and like, early June, late May, right? Which sets up SE1. And then, you know, there's a little break between SE1 and then SE2 push, which SE2, the day afterwards, we have our conference. So we basically get one conference, two conferences, and then the third conference, they're either there or they're not, right? So in May, I start planting the seeds with the district manager of like, hey, this is how the timeline's gonna go. And I need you guys to push your guys to go to our booth because this is the first time that I stole, I think it was still Texoma, I think. Um, we brought, brought our whole booth, oh, you're not Dave anymore. So <laughs> the, uh, 
I brought, <laughs> I brought, a, I, I brought, like, I brought my booth display, and I got a bunch of stuff, right? And so I'd get to the conference early, and there's like a section either at the front or wherever it makes sense, and set up my entire booth display. Like, did the did the big backdrop, did the side tables, did the whole nine, you know, got everything set up like as if I was working an event. And then I would put like a little thing on the front table. That one I definitely stole from you guys. I um, put a little thing that was like qualifications, work on the events team, like sell this much, go to training, sell this much, work for shows, sell this much, do this, so on and so forth. I basically had the hierarchy just on a printed out piece of paper propped up and it would sit right there on the front cutting board, right? And I would work the booth when, and people would mob the place and DMs would funnel their kids over, right? And I got FaceTime to actually start planting the seeds in May about coming to training, you know, in August, SE2. And so we did that, and then we did the same thing for SE1, because guess what? Management in the summertime, they're gonna launch a crap load of kids during June, and especially late May, once they didn't get to go to the last conference. Now I'm gonna get a bunch of new faces, and I get FaceTime with the people that I talked to already, right? And then, um, because that's really the only two cracks I get, because at SE2, they're there, right? SE2, and the next day is then training. But I found that, number one, communication with the DMs was important. That way they can be, again, I speak through them in all of their offices, because I can't be there, obviously, all physically all the time. So I speak through them physically. And then um, I had a poster that I made. And by the way, like, that is on our website. Like, it's our about me, like the meet the team thing. Like, that's the poster that um, I gave to all the DMs. They laminated it, you know, put it up in their office next to their, like, training boards and stuff, because it's on the wall, it gets promoted for the most part. And so the idea is, is that we planted the seed as early as possible. I brought my booth display for the division conference. I brought it for SC1, and I brought it for SC2. I would just get there early, you know. I would have a varsity member, like, help me set up, and uh, we'd get the booth set up, and I would work the booth in between, you know, talks and stuff. And then, uh, and even if I wasn't there, if I was off doing something else, there would still be people funneling around the booth, you know, reading the little thing that I have there about events, and it creates a lot of questions. And, um, yeah, that, that, that's pretty much the game. That's what I did. And set up my booth display, make it look as badass as possible, make it look like, a professional program, right? And then promote it a lot, and then people show up to training. Thanks. Yeah. Everybody, let's give uh, these guys a big. It. Oh, go ahead. Hang on. Well, one, one thing, real quick. Sorry. I know. I know. I want to clap for me too. Okay. Um, <laughs> Well, one, one thing really quick, guys, there's just there's not there's not a good place on the agenda to, to just touch on this, but since we're about to hit the break, I, I, I have to just say this. It, one of the things that everything that defines our program is just a partnership approach. Um, it's us partnering up with people on the team to, to get into challenging events. It's us partnering with promoters and them seeing us as a resource. It's us partnering with DVMs, which we'll talk about later today. But, but this is unsolicited. I can tell you that um, us partnering with outside experts has been such a huge part of our program. And, and I'm not shilling for anyone out there, but I can just tell you, like, we look like a $3 million program now because we've invested significantly. We invested $50,000 between November of uh, 2017 and November of 2018 between booths, visual displays, and things like that. $50,000. I'm not kidding. Now, you don't need to do that, but I think that as coordinators, Got, you know, Luke and I think it was Von Packard back when they first came out to Texoma years and years and years ago for the State Fair of Texas, they would always say, what would coach do? You know, what would coach do? And, and there's just a level where when you can align yourself with good systems and good people, I would just encourage you, if you're not at a place where you can afford some of this stuff, I would still go connect with vendors. I would talk to DPZ. I would see how Vast Action can help you manage not just a content email, but how can you manage some of your, your chain throughout key events? We, we pay Vast to do some of that. It's amazing. Brandon Durant, guys, we all use his binder. I, so wellness mats are huge. I, I would really just say that when you think about how to scale your program, widen your vision for who the influencers are, because Dante did such a good job of speaking to the influencers being the CSPs, but, but the influencers in your program can be whoever you trust to partner up with, and whether that's vendors, it should be your DVM, other people, and even other teams. Um, while we're here, let's open the net between each other and, and other good resources. I, just, I had to get that out. Awesome. Um, I'm curious, really quick, by show of hands, how many of you wish you had an even better relationship with your DVM than you already do? Raise your hand. 
How many of you feel like you have an amazing relationship with your DVM already? Cool. So uh, later tonight, Brian's going to be facilitating a panel on working with your DVM. And I can tell you that I've seen the content that's going to be covered. And it's really amazing. And even those of you that have strong relationships with your DVM, I want to challenge and encourage you to be in the room with your teams during that message. Because that's going to be our wrap up to the evening. And it's going to be pretty incredible. So thank you, everybody. Let's give these guys a big round of applause. Dave Bush as well. Enjoy lunch. Enjoy your time with the vendors. We'll see